The Unshackled Waves, episode 214. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. One of the beliefs that the regressive left have been pushing in the West over the past decade, mainly coming from their feminist cohort, is that of man-hating. That men, mainly white men, are responsible for everything that is wrong with our modern society and spend all of their time trying to protect their patriarchy and discover new ways to oppress women. This summer has seen the left's man-hatred reach new heights. This began with Gillette's new advertisement, The Best a Man Can Be, which attacked their own male consumers. We saw masculine ideology deemed a psychological disorder and the tragic rape and murder of a Arab Israeli student in Melbourne saw feminist rage again about toxic masculinity and rape culture in our society holding all men responsible for it. The Women's March, which began in 2017 as a rally against President Trump's inauguration, occurred worldwide again this year. Bizarrely, it is organised by a Sharia law supporter. Then we saw a bunch of Catholic high school boys attending the annual pro-life march in Washington, D.C., accused of racism against a Native American activist by the fake news media. And these boys were subjected to death threats before the whole tape was released and they were exonerated. So to discuss this summer Summer of man-hating, as I call it. I am joined today by media personality the feminists hate the most and our newly crowned 2018 Culture Warrior of the Year, the ever-wonderful Daisy Cousins. Daisy, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Now, first of all, congratulations on taking out our Culture Warrior <laughs> of the Year award. It was very competitive among our nominees, but you obviously have the most uh, devoted followers and they love the, the opportunity to cast their vote for you. Well, thank you very, very much for nominating me. First of all, I was I was extremely excited um, to get that nomination and it was stiff competitions and really good people up there. Um, and I, so I'm really, really stoked that um, that I won it. And yes, my my followers are the loveliest bunch of people like I'm my whole my YouTube following and my Twitter and Facebook following. Um, it's the most wonderful community. And I'm so glad that we all kind of congregate and talk. So I was really um, very flattered and grateful that they um, actually they took the time to, you know, click the link and vote. So I was like, oh, it was, it was very, very sweet. So I'm, I'm really, really pleased and very grateful. So thank you. Very cool. Now, I keep meaning to get trophies made up for these awards, <laughs> but it keeps getting pushed down the to-do list. So I don't have one to present you with, but hopefully next time we, we meet in person, we can do a proper uh, trophy presentation. And <laughs> That would be great fun. I like trophies. I did competitive dance growing up, and I used to have lots of them in my room. So I would approve of a trophy if ever one came to fruition. <laughs> Now, the reason I've had you on today is because it appears to have been a summer of man-hating. It's just exploded over the summer, and obviously this is one of your areas of expertise. And it really started to, to kick off with the Gillette ad. Now, they make uh, men's razors, and they released a new advertisement campaign last week. They replaced their 30-year-old slogan, the best a man can get with the best a man can be. Now, the ad was designed to attack toxic masculinity i think if i hear that term again it's 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 just so uh grated on me now it was released in the wake of the the me too era now but the examples in the ad they had of male behavior that was deemed toxic is finding women attractive which is a perfectly natural male behavior uh, flirting with women and boys playing rough in the backyard it was a really low bar for for what was considered toxic masculinity yeah, look, I was very irritated by um, the Gillette ad. I mean, the the whole thing about toxic masculinity, it sometimes is misconstrued to be a dig at all masculinity. Um, but what it actually is, I mean, it's a theory. It's, it's you know, it's not a tr tried and tested gospel. It's a, it's a feminist theory that talks about um, facts, factors of what they call traditional masculinity being toxic. And as in this ad, it was, you know, um, 
have men having any kind of sex drive and um the fact that and i agree with this but the fact that men do feel pressure to restrain themselves emotionally which is arguably one of the reasons the male suicide rate is so high men don't seek help and um how allegedly men encourage each other to be violent and one up each other it's and so they're like oh that's toxic masculinity and that is the reason that all of the problems that men happen to cause in the world happen um and so that theory has been weaponized though in recent years to become a dig at all masculinity and all men they've they've sort of shifted the goalposts a bit with it and they're trying to demonize traditional masculinity um which is you know chivalry brawn um you know yes being attracted to women because if men weren't attracted to women then the human race would die out <laughs> so i don't know how that's a bad thing um and it's what you'd call conservative masculinity um you know it's that sort of old fashioned gentleman thing and um since it's mainly people from the regressive left who are pushing this theory of toxic masculinity it's another it's another way of um digging at the right basically and digging at conservatism and um conservative ideology so it, it's marxism dressed up as feminism dressed up as we actually care about men but actually we don't if any of that makes any sense um now the problem I really had with um the Gillette ad was that um it wasn't demon I I think people are wrong when they say it was demonizing all men because they had those sort of male saviors in there doing the right thing or whatever but what it did is that it portrayed those good men as the exception to the rule so it conveyed men as having committed the original sin of being born a male and that uh, portrayed them as that they have to strive their whole lives to atone for atone for this sin and resist the temptations of their inherently vicious vile nature it's extremely catholic you know like when you think about it this sort of male culpa that apparently men have to do and that they have to rely on the reformed sinners amongst them who will prevent them from engaging in that toxically masculine behavior so it was this sort of exception to the rule thing um that i took issue with um and it was clearly um well it was it was directed by a woman it was directed by an australian woman um and that was extremely clear because it obviously came before i even it was even confirmed to me that a woman had directed it i thought there's a chick behind that there's no way a man conceived of that that's a chick like, oh, you'd be surprised these days well that is a good point but basically this this whole push about toxic masculinity comes from women who don't actually understand men um and they don't attempt to understand men because they don't like men and are happy to pathologize men and whether that's through their own learned behavior or perhaps they've had bad experiences with men in the past they don't understand men and the male psyche and yes you know some men behave badly but that's because they're jerks not because they're men it's not a byproduct of this so called toxic masculinity and i just think it's it's extremely harmful for boys and teen and adolescent like ch ch children who are boys and teenage boys to see that kind of stuff in the media because they don't have the resilience or the life skills or the um you know the mental or emotional capacity to kind of wade past the superficiality of that and it's so discouraging and would be so i reckon hurtful to a lot of them to see all of the you know natural instinct for rough and tumble play or to you know um politely approach a woman at a bar or whatever up uh, demonized as something that's inherently wrong i mean you know young men receive no encouragement at all now in the public arena it's all just you know scolding and condescension um so that was a real um you know ideological bombshell <laughs> for for me to deal with that Gillette app yeah and i urge everyone to go and check out you've got your own video on it on your yes. channel yes, and I do. one of the things that struck many people as odd about this advertising campaign is they want men to buy their their razors so it's an odd strategy even in this corporate virtue signaling age of a corporation to basically say to their target audience mm. you've got to better yourselves but still buy our products mm. well here's the interesting thing about that i mean um There's that whole saying, you know, go work, go broke, but I don't think that'll happen in the case of Gillette because yes, it's selling men's products, but women do most of the shopping. You know, women are generally the ones who go and do the grocery shopping and buy a packet of their 
um, husband's raises. So what, what this ad is really doing, as I said, a woman was behind it. It's catering to women and catering to sort of women's insecurities, or at least what Gillette has perceived to be catering to women. And it also kind of tugs at the maternal heartstrings a bit when you see the footage at the end of those, you know, very sweet looking little boys, you know, watching their fathers and watching the learned, you know, their fathers behave well. Um, so really, it's a genius marketing tool. And you add to that the fact that now Gillette's name is everywhere. And the majority of people in the world are actually politically disengaged. Their priority is sort of not, you know, fighting the culture war. It's important things like paying the bills and raising their kids and paying the school fees. So people who don't care about the politics of it will just say, oh, the, see, oh, Gillette, Gillette, Gillette. I should go buy some Gillette razors. So it's a roundabout genius marketing tool, even though they've got a bit of bad publicity in the meantime. Wow, that's quite a black pill <laughs> yep. to conclude that. Very sad. I'm sorry, but that's that's uh, the theory that was relayed to me, and I, I, I tend to agree with it. There was a, a mock uh, Gillette ad that I saw, that because they also do women's razors, it's their, yeah. their Venus brand, and uh, people were pointing out that it, uh, you couldn't imagine Gillette putting out a advertisement saying, women, stop being nagging bitches. Yeah. Yeah, I know, of course not. And that's the sort of double standard. And um, I actually did another video as a follow-up to the Gillette ad on called on toxic femininity. Yeah, that is, was a yeah, good yeah. one. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And te toxic femininity isn't at all a technical term. It's sort of a, it's a hypothetical that I've seen mm. going around. But um, my my thing is if okay, if you are going to claim that men have an intrinsic cultural problem within their ranks called toxic masculinity that causes bad behavior that is say male typical. I mean, you know, people go on, you know, feminists go on. Oh, you know, men are the most violent. They cause the most. But well. Of course they do, because one, they've got superior physical form, two, they have more testosterone, and three, that's how they've evolved throughout history. They've evolved to be the warriors of the human race, which was necessary to protect the women, because women were the ones who bore children. So you, 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 you can't say that men are somehow toxic because they're more like, well, probably more suited to engage in physical force um, than women are. So, you know, you can also say, yeah, I think it is true, for instance, that men do suffer pressure to suppress their emotions. And I don't think anyone would argue that men should be encouraged to express themselves. But women also have behavior typical to women um, that is extremely damaging and extremely destructive. And I, I looked at a bit of that. And one is um, women are biologically programmed to compete with each other for resources and resources being a suitable mate. Um, to protect their bodies and protect their ability to reproduce. And it goes right back to the days of the cavemen um, when a woman had to literally find the man with the biggest club to protect the door of the cave while she raised the kids inside. You know, the man would go and use his superior physical form to hunt and to gather and to fight off predators while she would raise the kids. And But you had to compete for that as a woman because if you didn't have it, you wouldn't survive. And that's been true all the way throughout history and it remains true today if you look at say how women behave towards each other in the workplace um, and when they're adolescents and um, whilst I did a lot of research on male and female bullying for this video and whilst boys are more likely to beat each other up um, and tend to be more opportunistic um, with their bullying girls will use something called relational aggression and they tend to be very premeditated in picking their targets and relational aggression is things like off spreading rumors spreading gossip ostracizing you know which is made particularly bad in the world of social media they'll say strategically not invite someone to a social event and then post photos about it on facebook um you know they'll, they'll try to sabotage relationships they have with boys and even their grades um and all of this is to achieve status which is the most important thing and that continues through the workplace and there are these um you know statistics that say that women when they bully at work are choose a female target in two thirds of cases and they call it the rope ladder effect. So a woman will climb to the top of the rope ladder, but instead of helping other women up, she drags the ladder up behind her because she wants to maintain status. And um, when you point this behavior out, and then of course, obviously there's the oft underreported phenomenon of women beating up their male partners in intimate partner violence, you know, women abusing their children, which is a very hush hush topic according to the popular narrative nowadays. Um, now, 
when you do get usually feminists to agree that, okay, maybe women bully each other in this way, their knee-jerk reaction is, oh, but that that's not as bad as, as toxic masculinity because that kind of behavior doesn't lead to violence or to death, right? Well, that's wrong when you consider the amount of um, teen suicides that happen, you know, because of relational bullying from girls or the terrible psychological damage that is done, um, you know, by relational bullying, you know, the uh, depression, anxiety, often girls who are victims of that will have trouble forming healthy friendships. Um, there's a huge amount of damage that comes from toxic female behavior. And it, as I mentioned, it does lead to death. It does lead to violence. If you look at um, IPV statistics. Um, so, you have to be willing to admit if you are going to insist that men have a toxic element that causes them to behave in a, in a certain way that women have to have the same thing you know men and women are different but we're not that different on some levels and to say otherwise is just hypocritical and nonsensical yeah in your video you talked about how it's much more hidden toxic femininity oh, yeah. or what what you want to call it because it is it's a form of psychological war warfare it's yeah. very scheming that there, there's a lot of going behind people's backs it's all all in the background so it's not as obvious as say a fist to the the yeah. face or yeah. so, something like that where you see it and it's Whoa. Yeah, well, that's what makes it harder to pick, you know, so often girls are underrepresented in bullying statistics because even if boys build each other up, you've got cuts and bruises and black eyes, but with girls, you don't have any of that physical evidence. So often it flies under the radar, which makes it so, so insidious and the treatment can go on for months or years. So it's, it's very interesting. Now, toxic masculinity, or, or there's a, a new term now, masculinity ideology, it's now Ooh. classified as a type of psychological disorder by the American Psychological Association. This was brought to my attention by, I call her the, the godmother of anti-feminism, Bettina Arndt. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she alerted us all to this. Now, apparently, masculinity ideology manifests itself in anti-femininity, uh, achievement, a school of the appearance of weakness, and adventure, risk, and violence. Now, this was definition or classification was needed because apparently oh, uh, men commit 90% of all homicides in the US. They're far more likely than women to be arrested and charged with intimate partner violence and the power and privilege they have over their female counterparts. Now, this is one of the things where I'd say there's some truth in that and there's other things where it's clear that they're they're singing from the the, the feminist songbook. Yeah, um, I mean this this whole thing with the APA um, is incredibly sad and stupid. I mean, as I mean as I mentioned before, yes, men do commit most of the most violence and of course most homicide. Um, but as I mentioned, you know it's really wrong to put that down to sort of toxic masculinity or you know masculine ideology um rather than biology and evolution that's how we've kind of formed as a human species and that, that's not to say we should accept that violence from men happens no on the contrary but in order to pathologize masculinity um in this way well that's not actually doing anything to help the problem um that's just pushing an ideology so it's senseless to me that the apa is doing this and what it also means um it, it's demonizing things like adventure and risk taking well can you imagine what would have happened throughout human history if men hadn't followed those so-called impulses to be adventurous and take risks like nothing would happen what what this means is though that um, so this is a guidance manual that they've written. So psychologists are now going to be encouraged to treat men with mental illness as being victims of their own um, intrinsically damaging psyche. Uh, I don't know how that's supposed to help anyone. Um, and it's it's very, very clear, as you said, that sure, some of it is, um, you know, interesting and legitimate. But from what I've read, most of it is simply a, a political infiltration of the APA. And I, I don't see how it's going to be in any way helpful um, to helping or, or treating men with um, with mental and psychological conditions. And it reminds me of how there's this trend these days. Young boys, they've always been rough and, and tumbling love to run around in that. And there's been this trend to diagnose them with ADHD, put them on, on Ritalin and that. It reminded me of that. And we have the peak psychological association now saying that these 
behaviors in boys which have always been there and yes sometimes young boys can be a bit rough and what you do is you just have a word with them saying you're playing a bit too rough there just gentle down but mm. now these days everything has to go to a doctor or a psychologist for a psychoanalysis yeah, I mean, that's an interesting one. I don't know enough about um, ADHD or that sort of situation to comment too much. Obviously, there are um, boys who do have attention deficit disorders, um, but I, I would agree that there is um, an instinct nowadays when you have a rambunctious boy to jump straight to the ADHD um, suspicion and, and perhaps diagnosis. And I, I remember I've read somewhere that Kids that act out in class, for instance, at school, a lot of the time it's just because they're bored because mm. they're much smarter than everyone else. So if they're, you know, five or six years old, um, they obviously haven't learned how to express themselves properly yet. You know, oh, miss, I'm bored. Can I go and do something else? So what do they do? Will they find other ways to amuse themselves, which usually involve acting up? So, you know, perhaps, um, I mean, I was talking to... Um, a friend of mine the other day who has sons and she was saying that the education system now is from what she's observed is really geared towards girls in the way that they teach them to teach boys and girls in primary school it's very much geared to how girls learn um, as opposed to boys who are a bit more practical who like to kind of fix things and, and pick things up and, and develop those fine motor skills so um, you know you combine that with this sort of rush to judgment on boys rambunctious behavior and it's no wonder that you know boys are Fini are not finishing high school and not finishing university. Now, there was a terrible tragedy in Melbourne last week when mm -hmm. uh, Arab-Israeli uh, international student Aya Masawi was brutally raped and murdered. Um, we, we won't talk about the specific details because it is so horrific, but we saw that the feminists in Melbourne, they had their op-eds ready to go. There was uh, a vigil arranged a couple of nights later, and uh, this was led by Clementine Ford, who you've uh, dealt face-to-face -face with. Mm. Now, the weird thing about this is that she, she not only said that this was an example uh, this rape and murder of misogyny and, and rape culture, but she also blamed racism and white supremacy because uh, Aya was an Arab Israeli and said that uh, people who have nationalist views, they're just as responsible. And this was before we even knew the identity of the alleged killer, who was uh, Cody Herman, who turned out to be an Aboriginal. Now, the race of the perpetrator should not matter but feminists expose themselves here as uh, not just wanting to demonize all men but they have a specific they want to t want to demonize white men specifically white conservative men and and then there was a complete turnaround in the in the media where uh they started referring to herman they called him an aspiring rapper was a troubled teenager with an ab absent family and it just I just couldn't understand the, the cognitive dissonance that if, like, you assumed that the, the perpetrator was white and so you went all in about this is a shameful uh, th thing about our uh, toxic masculinity society, but then when you learn that the alleged perpetrator is non-white, you all of a sudden just backtrack. Yeah, um, that was uh, disgusting. Um, what Clementine did with that article, I mean, poor... Aya died in about the worst way a person can go. Um, that's all I'll, I'll say about that. As you, we won't go into the details, but it's about the worst way you can go. Um, and she had not been gone even a day from memory. I might be wrong, but it, it, it seemed like less than a day. And this article came out. There was not even a hint of a suspect. Um, you know, the police didn't have any of that information. And yet Clementine jumps in and writes an article about it. Now that's her shtick as a feminist and I expected some commentary from her on it and that's that's fine. Um, but she leapt immediately um, to implicate a white man in this and she talked about politicians are so concerned with protecting our values when really that's just a veil for white supremacy and you know white people need to you know analyze themselves and men men you need to pick a side. Um, was the quote. So she immediately implicated white men and there was a screenshot of a post that went around from her on Facebook where in response to that article, I believe someone said, um, uh, do you know 
definitely whether it's a white man. And she said, well, there's been no information yet on the race of the suspect. So I'd, I'd say almost definitely, yeah, yes, I it would be. Yeah, I published that screenshot. Yeah, oh, that was you. Oh, good. Well picked. Well picked. Um, and then it turned out to be an Aboriginal man with a history of criminal behaviour um, who was evidently a possibly um, or had some sort of well, probably had some sort of conduct, conduct disorder like sociopathy or psychopathy because normal men don't commit those types of acts. You know, women are more likely to be sexually assaulted in their own homes than they are in a back alley at night. Um, so men who commit those crimes are not normal people. They're not representative of any kind of masculinity. They're certainly not representative of men as a whole. And they have something, they have a kink, they have an some sort of evil within them and you can call that psychological or neurological whatever you want but they're not normal men so pinning that behavior on toxic masculinity is completely unhelpful what you need is better policing in that situation um but clementine jumping straight on it and saying it was a, a white man was it really was very exposing of her for one sloppy journalism to jump on it before there's even a suspect before you've even got all of the information. And two, it was so obvious that she just wanted to use that poor girl's passing um, as an opportunity to push her own narrative, which is profoundly anti-white male. And I've never been able to work out what she has against white men. And I think it's one, it's part of her own kind of virtue signaling. Um, you know, she wants to go, look at me, I'm not racist. I love racial minorities and let's bag out the white man. Therefore, I'm a virtuous human being. And two, it's the, it's the sort of cultural Marxism of it. I mean, if you look at original kind of, this is a broad brushstrokes thing, but originally it was about um, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. Um, so it was, you know, one class of people oppressed another class of people. Well, that's continued into feminist ideology. Only the bourgeoisie are straight white men and the proletariat to those who are oppressed by the oppressor are women and racial minorities and the LGBT community. So it's part of that attitude as well. But I thought it was really, really sincerely unprofessional of Clementine to politicize her death aside from anything else and use it to push something that was ultimately proved false and then not to issue any kind of apology or retraction. It was really, I mean, have some respect for God's sake. Yeah, that article was published on Fairfax's Daily Life. And I noticed that after the suspect had been arrested, that uh, she deleted it uh, from her social media. But uh, Fairfax, they're, they're not going to have that much less of journalistic integrity to delete the article from uh, their platform itself. So it's still there. It's just not promoted by by anyone. So you can still go back and, and see uh, what she said. And of course, the, it's interesting how the, the left, like when there's a terrorist attack, for example, they say, oh, don't exploit a tragedy to uh, fuel your political agenda. But mm -hmm. th that's it's always the case that they're saying only we can do that uh, when, yeah. when it suits our agenda yeah. as well. And it's, a lot of people, they also analysed uh, Herman's uh, social media. He did share a lot of Aboriginal rights memes. And, and this was another folly as well, attacking conservative men, because monsters can be any political ideology. They yeah. can be leftist, conservative. I mean, an act of evil can be committed by any man or woman uh, of any political persuasion. Yeah, I, I mean, um, evil doesn't discriminate um, gender, race, political ideology, nothing. I mean, um, it, and it depends, look, it depends on how you define evil as well. I mean, there are people who are psychopaths, so they, that is, that's a conduct disorder. Um, so they have a, they don't, you know, I, 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 again, I'm not a psychologist, but from what I have read about the disorder, you know, they don't feel fear or remorse. Um, they're often narcissistic. Um, and so they can commit the most appalling acts, do the most appalling things and can somehow justify it to themselves because they don't get the normal reaction that a normal person which would get, which is, oh my God, what have I done? This is the, this is, you know, terrible, terrible guilt and desire to atone. Um, 
and that kind of that kind of conduct disorder, um, I believe, is more common in men. I'm not a hundred percent sure on that, but um, if you look at if you want to classify that kind of thing as manifesting an evil, you can, or you can take the more sort of Old Testament approach, I suppose, which is to say that there are some people in this world who are who are simply evil. They have a kink. Um, you know, and, or, and, you know, again, you can get even more Catholic with it and say, well, they can't be saved. You know, I wouldn't go with that theory. But, yeah. Um, Obviously I was using it in the, the biblical hmm. sense, which yeah. is ironic since I'm an atheist. Yeah. Now I, I get told, uh, as a, as a man, like, I don't understand what it's like for, for women to, uh, feel unsafe going home at night. And that was the big thing that, uh, women should have a right to feel safe going home at night. But I recall when I was growing up, uh, we were, we were told when we go out at night, don't look at somebody the wrong way because, you know, they might think that you're having a go at them and they could just go and king hit you. And there's been countless one punch attacks where men have got serious brain damage or, or mm. died. Yeah. And that is, is something which is a major problem in our society. And if you look at the actual homicide statistics in Australia, 67% of murder victims are male. Now, of course, we want women to be able to uh, get home safe at night. They, they they shouldn't have to fear, but it also should be the same for everyone. And I think that the reason why whenever this happens to a a, a woman, because there, there's been two other horrific rape and murders uh, in Melbourne, is because society, they do they, they do believe that, that women are the, the gentler sex. And so when a physical crime is committed against a woman, there is more of an emotional thing. So if, to, put, uh, to put it this way, it, our society, they basically view a, a horrific act against a woman greater. They, they see that as the greater crime. So it's actually the opposite of what people like Clementine think. I, I think, of course, women should be able to feel like they can get home safely, but then so should men. Uh, you know, everyone should feel like they should get home safely at night. And men are more likely to be victims of violent crime and random attacks than women are. As I said, women are more likely to get attacked in their own homes um, than they are walking the streets late at night. So you're in more you're in more danger as a man walking around late at night than you are as a woman. Um, so, but yeah, it is interesting how... Um, you know, it is viewed as a greater tragedy when women are victims of violent crime than when men are. And it is maybe it's our knee jerk reaction to the fact that women don't have the superior physical form in order to defend themselves um, in that situation. And perhaps that's why some people instinctively jump to the conclusion that it's somehow worse. But I, I don't think that means men deserve any less sympathy for being jumped late at night or stabbed or, or king hit or, or punched or, or any of those horrible things that have happened. Um, so again, as I say, to put sort of, you know, all of these incidents, incidents down to, oh, well, if we can just fix toxic masculinity, then none of this will happen. Well, no, you need, you need better policing. Uh, you know, they, they need, people need to be more upfront about conduct disorders and how to deal with them. It's, it's not some pushing some sort of hypothetical theory that, that could possibly save the world. You know, there's a real practical thing here and everyone deserves to go around without fear of violence. Well, policing and safety in Melbourne, that's a whole other topic, which I've written yep. a, a, a lot on. Mm -hmm. Now, there was the, the Women's March uh, last weekend, which uh, the, the first one occurred in Washington, D.C. on Trump's inauguration in 2017. And it basically stemmed from the belief that Trump was a misogynist. There was Ashley Judd embracing the term nasty woman. I, w I won't say it how she pronounced it because it's just so cringeworthy how she, mm. she did it. And then we had Madonna say she had thought a lot about uh, blowing up the, the White House. So she just put out there that she thought about committing an act of uh, terrorism. And then there were also the, the pink pussy hats from Trump's uh, grab them by the pussy comment. But of course they're now deemed transphobic because they exclude yeah. women who, who don't have vaginas. Now, two years later, the Women's March is 
divided. There was uh, a lot of division among various progressive groups about whether to support it because one of the organizers, uh, Linda Sassur, she's a Muslim who supports uh, Sharia law, uh, which is the opposite of women's rights. And she's also a supporter of uh, Palestine. Uh, so is another organizer, Tamika Melanie, which uh, there's been a lot of concern that the Women's March has become anti-Semitic, which it seems strange that for something that's uh, supposed to focus on women's and women's issues, it's become sidetracked on Israel and Palestine. I mean, what's up with that? Well, that's the problem with intersectionality is that um, it's, I gave a speech about this at Liberty Fest last year and I called it the Feminist Oppression Olympics. And there's sort of a, a scale of victim points. And if you have the most victim points, then your opinion is worth the most. And if you have the least amount of victim points, then you can't say anything. And but there's debate as to what constitutes who has the most victim points. Like, is it is it Muslim women or, or is it trans women or, or is it women with disabilities or, or is it Jewish women? So how do we how do we mesh all of this together and make sure the right person is up the top winning the Olympics, therefore having the most victim points and, and then then gets to speak more? And how do I not offend them? Like, there's a terrible amount of angst about it all. And I'd hate to be one of them. But that's what's happened um, with the Women's March and this, this sort of big anti-Semitism um, issue that's been going on. I mean, any idiot could have told you that. You've got, you know, Linda Sazor, who's a huge Palestinian advocate, which often comes with a strong dose of anti-Semitism. And then you've got Tamika Mallory, who went to, um, who, who's all buddy-buddy with the Nation of Islam and went to a uh, sort of a um, presentation um, earlier in the year or actually late last year. Um, which was pre presented by Louis Farrakhan, who's, who said the most appalling things about Jewish people, you know, calling them degenerates and talking about degenerate Jews in Hollywood, like the most uh, absolutely atrocious stuff he said about the Jewish community. Um, and she was there while he made some of these con comments and also posted a photo of herself on Instagram with Louis Farrakhan with her arm around him saying something like, oh, Louis Farrakhan, the original and the best. So if you've got that heading up the Women's March, well, that's a huge problem. And it's no wonder that people like, I believe, Deborah Messing and Alyssa Milano denounced it because of that issue. Um, and as for, um, this, is, this is what I hate about the regressive left. They, they pretend they're good people, but really they're just jockeying for power. That's what I can't stand about them. Um, and... Regarding sort of the pussy hat thing, um, not only are those hats now considered transphobic, they're also considered racist because not all women's genitals are pink. Oh, of course. Yeah, there's that, that factor as well. So uh, now there's nothing satisfies me more than when the regressive left eats itself. And that's what's happened with the Women's March. I will give credit to uh, the progressive groups and the media for actually focusing on this division in the Women's March, which... Finally. <laughs> finally, <laughs> they're, they're, they're going to point out faults. Finally, it's got this far and they're doing it. And it's not a general women's rights march because, like I said, it's a partisan thing against Trump. I mean, uh, they support things such as a federal uh, minimum wage. Uh, they, they focus on uh, abortion rights and also uh, passing the Equal Rights Amendment to the, the Constitution. And if you're a conservative woman who who voted for trump you're not going to be welcome there in fact they they blamed white women for electing trump there's that statistic 53 percent of white women voted for trump and so yeah it's mm. definitely not an inclusive movement no god no um you know white women have because of that been um kicked out of the oppression olympics so we're on the back benches now with white men you know throwing paper planes at the rest of the group ahead of us um we're in the naughty corner because of that um and see, the thing about um, the women's march is I like to call it um, the march for women who can afford to take off the day off work. You know, it's for it's for privileged, largely white women, funnily enough, who are rich enough to afford to take the entire day off and hang around in, you know, in Washington and, and scream at people. You know, it's not it's not a march for all women. And there was a, certainly a. Um, a woman appeared on Tucker Carlson um, just after the inauguration talking about um, the Women's March and she was part of a pro-life feminist group. So um, didn't like Trump, had concerns about his presidency and of course wanted to join in the Women's March. And she, the, the group was originally um, 
you know, on the website, helping promote it. But then it came out that their views on abortion were in the pro-life camp. And the justification she said to Tucker, she said, we believe that while, of course, women should have a right to choose, 50% of fetuses are going to be little girls. So where's their right to choose? Which I think is a, a really good example of pro-life feminism. And this came out and they were kicked out of the march like they were kicked off the website and they were they were denounced and they were made to feel completely unwelcome to the point where this woman who is clearly a progressive was on fox news on on tucker carlson talking about it so no it's not an inclusive marching at all it's for women who are privileged enough not to have to work for a day it's for women who have the right opinions about abortion it's for women who are certainly not conservative and it's, you know, given the instinctive, um, you know, push to have the pink pussy hats, it's evidently for women who are white and cisgender. Very stupid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, the Women's March, it was held a day after the March for Life, uh, which is the, the annual pro-life march in, in Washington. Now, that's the exact opposite of the the women's march in that it is inclusive you uh, even if you're not religious or conservative you're you're still welcome i mean i've been to pro-life uh, events in melbourne i've said i'm an atheist they say well welcome you know it's good that you know we have people like you supporting us as well i was i was welcomed with with open arms but mm -hmm. the main story that's come out of the the march for life uh was a group of uh school boys from covington catholic high school school they attended the the march for life and were wearing make america great again hats now they began began to be abused by a, a bunch of black hebrew israelites which i actually i didn't even know they existed until this whole thing happened apparently they're they're radical black uh supremacists it's uh, mm. you can do a whole nother uh, segment on them. But what happened then was uh, Nathan Phillips, who is an Indigenous Vietnam War veteran, he was intending there was an Indigenous People's March at the same time. He stood between the two sides and drummed in the boys' faces. And the, and the boys, they, they sang along and the, the schoolboy who's got the, the most attention is Nick Sandman. He mm. smiled in his face. Now, Phillips, he told the mainstream media that the boys were, were mocking him and were saying, uh, build the wall. That was not true at all. There, no. there was a full two hours of video release, which the, the boys, they, they didn't do anything. They were like singing along, like just as as anyone would with it and mm. they didn't they didn't say anything they didn't even respond to the abuse they were getting by the the black hebrew israelites and of course no. the 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 fake news outrage that uh, was unleashed upon them i mean it's just something that i don't think i've i've ever seen before and on a bunch of like minors who were, yeah. were just attending one of their their first public events i thought it was just disgusting yeah, it was it was it was awful. Um, it was absolutely um, terrible what happened to those boys. I mean, um, what actually happened when um, you know the rest of the footage came out? It ter it turns out that as as you said, they were being harangued by these black Israelites who were you know calling them you know the the f word by which I don't mean the four letter man. I mean the one with more letters. They were uh, like terrible homophobic slurs. Um, they were there was a black kid amongst them and they said that they berated him for being there and said that the white kids would harvest his organs um, you know they called them crackers and you know like terrible stuff and so the boys um, asked permission of their um, teacher chaperone if to drown out the harassment they could do their school chants and the teacher said yeah sure so they asked permission and that's why they were chanting it wasn't some big sort of display of male entitlement or toxic masculinity they were simply trying to drown out this terrible abuse they were getting from the black israelites um and nathan phillips is obviously a professional activist and a professional agitator um, who wanted to create a narrative. So he, well, it, while it was portrayed by the media as they, so, which and Nathan Phillips lied about this, he said that they surrounded him and that Nick Sandman uh, was actually actively blocking his way and was sort of shifting from side to side in order to prevent him from yeah. passing. The tape didn't show that true. at all. No, it did not show that at all. It was completely false. And the boys thought it was a cultural display, so they started kind of clapping along and, and smiling. But then um, it, after a while, they realized, hang on, this has been going on for several minutes. We don't quite know what's going on here. 
Um, and the footage they keep showing of Nick Sandman is him sort of with a little kind of smile, which they're saying is a smirk um, mm. while Phillips beats in his face. But there's further footage that's taken from another angle of the same incident. If you look at his face, he looks distinctly uncomfortable, quite intimidated, like he has no idea what to do. And he actually looks around at one point, like for his teachers or his friends to say, hey, uh, what's going on here? Can you help me? Um so they behaved extremely well in the face of this, but the, the and it's it's similar to Clementine. Um, is that these regressive leftist journalists wanted to make a narrative out of breaking news? So it was this you know a few seconds of decontextualized footage that went around, and they jumped on it because the narrative was too juicy. It was you know teenage white. Catholic boys from a Christian school at a pro-life march wearing Make America Great Again hats. I mean, like it was it was way too juicy to resist. And it was when interesting when all the um, other footage came out, um, there were I was talking to people on Twitter about this. They were point blank refusing to watch the extra footage and kept making, you know, making up reasons why they shouldn't and actually doubling down in their attacks on the boys, even though there was contrary evidence um floating around yeah, they used uh when they doubled down they they dug up a photo yeah. from 2012 when uh at covington there was a blackout basketball game which apparently mm. uh in u.s sports they have blackout white out blue out games where like you paint yourself black for the theme uh, it's something new that, that i found out but that's the context there but of course as well given what the media had just done to the Covington boys, they had no hesitation about digging up some other things to say, hey, oh, this is a terrible white supremacist high school. Oh yeah, the um the Covington the the photo, it was like it's what look, it's what they did with Kavanaugh. When the narrative that Kavanaugh um was somehow an attempted rapist started to fall through because Christine Blasey Ford's testimony was so inconsistent, no one could corroborate it, etc. Um, and then it was found that she was lying about a few things, um, or at least telling half truths. The, they shifted the goalposts and made the attacks about Brett, Brett's demeanor on the stand and his character in high school. And oh, he understated his drinking habits. So they're like, well, that didn't work. That's not working. So let's let's talk about let's let's throw a grenade over here. And we'll talk about this thing. And they did the exact same thing with the Covington boys. When the narrative that the boys had been teasing um, Nathan Phillips started to fall through because of this extra footage, they shifted the goalposts and they started attacking Covington as a whole. And they started attack attacking Catholic schools. And they dug up this photo, for, as you said, from 2012 um, and insisted the boys were in blackface when as a former student called Ryan Toller pointed out on Twitter, he's like, no, it's a blackout thing. We do this for every high school, no matter the ethnicity or race of the players, stop trying to push your false narrative. Um, but they, and even the new, I think the New York Daily News published that. Yeah, yeah, that um, was them. And they admitted in the article that the photo was unverified, but they still published it. And it wasn't even of the boys in question. Yeah. Those boys would have been about nine when the photo was taken and then there was a, a six second clip that went around that was taken by some girls of the group of boys yelling maga at them as they walked by but by and one of the girls was like oh i'm just so tired already and that was passed around to show that the boys were harassing young women but anyone with half a brain cell could look at that and work out there was an altercation prior to that given the fact she was already yelling over her shoulder and my guess is they probably walked past, seen the MAGA hats and yelled F Trump or something like that. And the boys were defending themselves. It's this detextualized, um, decontextualized footage passed around as gospel um, because one narrative hasn't worked. So they're pushing another. It's it's such a lack of integrity and professionalism. And some of the abuse from journalists and celebrities of the boys and uh, Nick Sandman in particular was just completely vile. There was the Disney producer, Jack Morrissey, who said he wanted to put the boys in a wood chipper. He didn't just say that. Chipper. Yeah, and he picked, yeah, shit with blood. Like, yeah. Blood? Yeah, I know there was, there, there was the most appalling thing said. Like there was, um, Reza, what's his name? Please help me with his last name. Uh, Reza, Reza Aslan. Aslan. Reza yeah. Aslan, yeah. He said, um, he said, he posted a photo of Nick and said, doesn't this guy have the most punchable face you've ever seen? You know, there were, there were people who were blue ticked accounts calling for these boys literally to be killed or at yeah. least subject to violence. You know, it was just the most, 
appalling thing. And I'm thinking to myself, you are grown adults. Here is some footage. Okay, looks bad, but it's totally decontextualized. How dare you jump on that and make those kind of comments about minors like 16 yeah. year old kids and the school had to be shut down on the yeah, tuesday because no, of like death, death threats. threats yeah i know i mean those poor kids are like they should all be at school having fun they shouldn't have to worry about this sort of social media media firestorm going on and my theory about the whole thing and this was actually echoed by joy behar on the view after i thought of it is that the reason they are so hysterical about this, and it's the same, the reason they got so hysterical about Kavanaugh is because they haven't managed to impeach Trump yet. They haven't managed to yeah. get their way. They thought they would have, they got their way for eight years with Obama in the culture wars. Now they, they didn't get their way in 2016, and they thought, oh, well, that won't be for long. We'll get rid of him. They haven't yet found a reason to, and they're freaking out, and they're lashing out in the same way that children do if children aren't getting their way. And Nick Sandman, despite only being 16 years old, he's reacted so maturely and articulately on, he's got a, a Twitter account where he's, he, he's posting very composed about, you know, it's sad that this is what it's come to in our country. Mm -hmm. The fact that the media and these commentators are so uh, dishonest, there's a lot of uh, calls for, for them to do a class action against the, the, the media because even though some of them have retracted, it hasn't been an apology. No. It's just been a quiet, no. uh, you know, read the fine print. Oh, we said this. They're, they're, Whoops! You know, it's not real. Uh, some uh, conservative commentators they fell for the the, the fake news, and uh, they obviously uh, they've published off ads saying, "Well, we've certainly learnt our lesson from this." And yeah, it's it certainly exposed just how dishonest the the mainstream media is. And it's also good that President Trump defended the boys as well, saying, "I know what it's like to be a victim of fake news," and he's invited mm -hmm. them to to the White House. So I think it was good that uh, Trump decided to use. Uh, his office as the presidency to make sure that well they're they're still just kids who are yeah, being kids. Be, yeah being being picked on that he, he was going to make sure he was going to take uh, take them under their wing oh yeah i thought it was um terrific that he did that and that's one of the reasons that um i like trump for all for all his flaws and he does have a few um he is he really just says what he thinks um, and when he puts his stake in the ground, he puts his stake in the ground. And when he sees that something is clearly wrong, no matter the backlash he knows he's going to get, he still sticks by it. And, and again, I, I refer back to Kavanaugh. Um, that was when Trump's kind of brash sort of business and businessman kind of, you know, brunt came into effect because, you know, people expected him to capitulate on Kavanaugh. He just said, no, this is wrong. I know exactly what's going on here and I'm sticking by my nominee and I'm getting him confirmed. And he did. And he's done the same thing here with the um, with the Covington boys. He's gone, no, this is wrong. This is clearly bad. I know what this is like. This has happened to me. I'm sticking by you boys, even though he knows he'll get trashed in the media um because of it but i guess he doesn't he doesn't care about the media now because they keep trashing him so i thought good on you mr president for doing that that showed great integrity and you've got a good uh breakdown of the the covington boy uh saga on your youtube uh, channel so i'd advise everyone to go and check that out because you've got all the examples uh yeah, listed I, I there I went, I went through a lot of footage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a lot of footage to make To that. prepare for this segment, I had to go through so much because there's just been oh, so yeah. so much uh, abuse and misreporting. It's so hard to keep up. Mm, yeah, I mean, there was a bit in my video. It was part of my This Week in Social Justice series. I discussed it as a topic. Um, I said in the video, I said, normally I would have more of a selection of tweets for you all to look at, but there has been so much social media hate going around. I actually don't know where to start. <laughs> um, if anyone wants a good analysis of social media firestorm, Sargon of a card did a really good one specifically focusing on just that. So if you want the scale of it, go and go and check out Sargon. He's done a good one. 
Well, I've appreciated you, Daisy, uh, coming on the, the show today to discuss uh, what has been a pretty crazy summer. Mm. Um, I know you're very busy uh, producing your own channel, which of course everyone should go and subscribe to. Uh, so I'm Thank glad you. that you've taken the time to, to, to come on here today. And of course, uh, look out for Daisy on Sky and elsewhere in the media. You recently reached 50,000 subs on, on YouTube. I and, did! I'm very excited, yes. And you you took the bold uh, step of deleting your Patreon account. I did. Um, you know, I'm sick of the... I I'm sure your viewers know about the Sargon of a card situation with, with Patreon, you know. sick of. I'm sick of big tech censorship. Patrons were sick of it as well. A lot of them were messaging me and going, I want to get the off this site, but I want to keep supporting you. Ha is there another platform I can use? Everyone was sick of it, so... Um, we all moved to Subscribestar, um, which um, copped a bit of crap recently because PayPal decided to get all ideological and pull their services. But Subscribestar weathered, weathered the storm, found another payment processor and are back up and running. Um, but I did. I deleted it on a live stream yesterday and it was with great satisfaction that I did so. So let's all support Subscribestar. We're fighting back against big tech uh, one, one step at a time. It's... Indeed one step at a time. Oh, take care and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Keep yes, up the great thank work. You. Thank you so much and thanks for having me. This was fun. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. As I mentioned, the winners of our 2018 Annual Unshackler Awards have been announced. I will leave the link to the results announcement and Damien Ferry's video summary in the show description. Thank you to everyone who voted to make this annual event another engaging time for the Unshackled. I hope you enjoyed your Australia Day. Our senior producer, Morgan Munro, was at the Australia Day Invasion Day events in Melbourne and whose video highlights is now up on our channels. We also have just launched a new video show, The Report from Tiger Mountain, with Richard Walsencroft, organiser of the Melbourne Underground Film Festival. You can see his first video, The Fake New Left Politics of Australia Day, on the Unshackled's YouTube channel, and it has also just launched its own Facebook page. We have three major Australian tours happening next month. There is the Deplorables Tour, which still hopes to feature Gavin McGuinness, Tommy Robinson, and Milo Yiannopoulos, which is hosted by Penthouse Australia. There is Dr. Jordan B. Peterson's return to Australia with special guest Dave Rubin and Dr. Stephen Hicks's first visit to Australia hosted by True Arrow Events. Remember that it takes us a lot of time and money to produce all the content that's on the Unshackled as well as to operate all our various platforms. We cannot do this without the support of our followers, especially in this age of deplatforming and when we are under close watch by our, the enemies of our agenda. We still have our Patreon open for now, so if you still pledge on the platform, you can find us at patreon.com slash the Unshackled, or you can send directly to our PayPal link, which is paypal.me slash the Unshackled. We also have a premium membership option on our website, which is the Unshackled .net slash support options slash premium membership. We are also looking at opening up a cryptocurrency support options as it is money that supports free speech and also plan to open up a Subscribestar account. So there are countless ways to support our work the way that you want to. Another way you can support our work is by buying some right thinking merchandise at uprightmarket.com. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.